Well, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, so before we begin, uh, welcome to our uh, last in our Orion series uh, lectures. It's been a phenomenal series, I hope you'll agree. Uh, but before we begin, I just want to start with our territorial acknowledgement that the University of Victoria acknowledges with respect the Lekwungen speaking people on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasinic peoples whose re historical relationship with the land uh, continues to this day. Uh, so today, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Drew Hayden Taylor. Drew's an Ojibwe from the Curve Lake uh, First Nations in Ontario. He's won, he's worn many hats in his literary career from performing stand-up comedy at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, to being artistic director of Canada's premier native theater company, Native Earth Performing Arts. He's been an award-winning playwright, a journalist, a columnist, appearing regularly in several Canadian newspapers and magazines, a short story writer, novelist, television script writer, and has worked on numerous documentaries exploring the native experience. As a playwright, Drew has proudly been a part of what he refers to as the contemporary native literary renaissance. An author of more than 20 plays, resulting in almost 100 productions that have left their mark on the Canadian theater scene. His many accolades include the Floyd S. Chalmers Award, Dora Maber Moore Award, and the Canadian Authors Literary Award. He's also been the recipient of many other varied honors, an honorary doctorate of laws at Mount Allison University, a plaque of honor on the Peterborough Walk of Fame, the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Award, Ontario's Premier Award, Premier Award for Creative Arts and Design, and Victoria Martin Lynch Staunton Award for Outstanding Artistic Achievement in the Theatre name but a few. Uh, please welcome Drew. Hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I am uh, coming to you from the Curve Lake First Nation in Central Ontario and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been a while since I've been to the big city of Victoria or the campus uh, and I'm here to talk I guess a bit about the development of contemporary native theatre in uh, Canada. Um, as you heard, I am one of those rare breeds of animals called a professional writer. That is to say, I um, spend most of my day writing. I do not have to spend my afternoon saying, would you like fries with that? But more interesting, more promisingly, is the fact that I am what you might consider a contemporary storyteller. And when I say contemporary storyteller, I'm talking about the fact that in the 21st century, there's so many interesting ways of telling stories. It used to be that most storytelling happened orally around a campfire, a bonfire, a kitchen table, etc. But as societies evolved, the methods for storytelling gradually began to evolve too, where um, storytelling began to spread into uh, such concepts as print as um, theater, as radio, television, movies, etc. And it's gotten to the point in today's society where even video games are developing um, intricate and detailed narratives within them for, for the game. And there are also the development of um, virtual reality. In fact, not only just virtual reality, but indigenous vir virtual reality. So in the 21st century, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to tell a story. And that's why what make what interests me more than anything else. So I have written novels, I've written plays, I've written short stories, I've creative nonfiction, I did a graphic novel, I've done television, I've done um, documentaries, etc. Because I'm very, very interested in telling stories and in ways of telling stories. But it wasn't always that way. Um, some of you who uh, I've talked to in the past uh, two days have heard some of this stuff, so please be patient. But um, I, I was born and raised and currently live on the Curve Lake First Nation, just north of Peterborough, Ontario. Um, it was a small reserve about, um, when I was growing up, about eight 900 people, about 1,400 now. And um, I come from both a big and a small family. I come from a big family because my uh, mother uh, was the oldest of 14, which is what used to happen before they had the internet. Now, um, so I have a gajillion amount of first cousins and a gajillion amount of second cousins. So I'm surrounded by lots and lots of family. But at the same time, 
I am, I come from a small family or um, I'm a, sorry, I come from, I'm a single child of a single parent. So I come from a small family and I'm a single child of a single parent primarily because my mother says that when I was born, I was 11 pounds, 13 ounces. I like to think I gave my mother both quantity and quality. So I grew up in this environment, um, out in the country, uh, on the reserve, surrounded by family, but me and my mother. So it was in a unique situation to grow where my imagination was allowed to flourish. And I could, I could um, develop ideas and games by myself or with my family. Now, the thing about growing up on a reserve is like growing up in any small town in Canada. Uh, there's only so many times you can go swimming, only so many times you can climb a tree, et cetera, et cetera. Things can get boring. And I'm, um, I'm about a thousand years old so that when I was growing up, we had, we didn't have internet. We didn't have satellite television. We had three stations. And if you don't understand this next phrase, this is something you can ask your teachers. Those three stations were usually very snowy. So I would get bored a lot. And uh, so as a result, I would read. I would read a lot. I would read as much as I could. And I would take books out constantly from the library. And I'd be introduced to all these strange, new, exotic places, strange, new, exotic people coming from all over the world that somehow landed on my lap. And I would read about all these wonderful places around the world that I never thought I would get to visit. And the more I read, the more I wanted to read. And the more I read, the more I became intrigued with the concept of writing. And gradually that little nugget began to grow in the back of my mind about the possibility of being a writer. But I didn't know if this was possible. Nobody in my family had been a writer. In fact, I didn't even know about the concept of writing. Um, Back then, there were no native writers. We were not, there was nothing in our curriculum. We didn't, weren't taught about native writers. There were none in the library. And so I wasn't sure if uh, native people were allowed to be writer, writers, you know, because you got to keep in mind, I was born two years after native people were given the vote. So the limitations and restrictions on indigenous people were still there and we're still trying to figure out where we fit in this Canadian world. Um, and myself, for those who are wondering who's the who's the guy with the bluish green eyes, I should also say that I've always considered myself, I'm biracial, but unicultural. My father was white, but he took off before I was born. So I was raised on the reserve in this environment, in the environment of the Anishinaabe. Um, and that was the world I knew. My standard joke is I'm half Ojibwe, half Caucasian. So technically that makes me an occasion or as I like to say, a special occasion, if not a memorable occasion. So I'm growing up on the reserve. I'm interested in being a writer, but what do you do in that situation? Well, I decided to do some research. I decided to talk with people who were much more knowledgeable about the topic than I was. First person I went to was my grade 11 English teacher. I went to him and I remember very distinctly, he, I walked into the room and he was looking for something in the bottom left-hand drawer of his desk. And I walked up to him and I said, sir, is it possible to make a living from creative writing? And without looking up, he said, no, not really. And um, that stayed with me. This is my grade 11 English teacher telling me this. There's not much point in being a writer. And as the decades went by and the years went by, and I actually did become a writer, and I'm a fairly successful one, um, Whenever one of the one of the fringe benefits I get to do is I frequently get to travel the country and the world, frequently talking with young people about the art of writing. And the one thing I always tell young people, if there's one thing I can teach you, the only thing you need to remember when you walk out that door, the only nugget of information that you um, should take with you is never trust your grade 11 English teacher. Second person I went to was my mother. I told my mother I wanted to be a writer and my mother looked at me with a very perplexed look and said, why do you want to be a writer? It's not going to get you anywhere. And um, that was my mother. That was uh, what she said to me. And I perfectly understand where she was coming from. 
my mother had a grade six education. She came, um, she, her first language was Anishinaabe and she spent most of her adult life cooking and cleaning for white people. So the concept of being a writer was just literally not on her radar. So with all this, I decided um, there's no point in being a writer. I am, uh, nobody thinks I can do it. Nobody thinks there's a point to doing it. So I gave up wanting to be a writer. But the interesting thing is it's not so much a, a case of me, of my art wanting to track me down and tell me I'm an artist. Um, it's more of a case of me seasoning myself, finding, I, I wasn't ready to be a writer. I didn't have enough to say, I didn't have enough experience. There's more, I needed to find out more about the world before I had something to say about the world. So I wanted to be a writer. I wasn't going to be a writer. And I ended up going to college for radio and television broadcasting because I had to take something. I want to take something. I wanted to leave the reserve, go experience the world. And I didn't know what to take. And then I saw, um, I saw a course called radio and television. I thought, wow, no problem. I listen to radio. I watch television. How difficult can that be? And it was a journalism course. And I learned about journalism, which was like the worst thing I could take because uh, I was very shy and basically the, the structure of journalism is phoning people up you don't know and then frank and asking them questions that are frankly none of your business so i wasn't very good at it but i graduated and i ended up kicking around toronto doing odd jobs but when i say odd jobs i'm talking about odd jobs in the arts community if i couldn't be a writer i still wanted to hang around with artsy people i i you know the thing about the arts is arts is the ability to create a work of art out of nothing but a figment of your imagination. That intrigued me. And if I, if it wasn't me, I wanted to hang out with people who it was. So I worked with various companies, organizations, and things in Toronto during my early 20s. I, um, I worked for the Canadian Native Arts Foundation, now called Inspire. I worked for CBC Radio as a trainee producer. I did the sound on two documentaries on Native culture. And I finally ended up working for a television series, um, a 13 part series being shot in Northwestern Ontario. And this is sort of where things began to get interesting for me. Um, I knew nothing of film production. So as a result, I got, I was doing all the blow jobs. I was doing production assistant, casting assistant, chaperone, et cetera. And I was also the technical advisor because they were do, shooting this series in Northwestern Ontario. I was the only native person in the office or on the production crew. The producers were non-native, the writers were non-native, the directors were non-native, and a third of the cast was non-native. So I was the technical advisor. They would give me the scripts to read for technical accuracy. I would read them, they'd say, is it accurate? And I would say, yes, native people eat toast. But the interesting thing is I would read them and through and, and I had to take them apart for production. And then it was through this I began to learn the structure of a half hour Canadian television show through osmosis, through unconscious or subconscious means. By taking the show together, deconstructing it, I learned how the structure of a half hour television show. I didn't end up writing for that show, but about a couple months later, when I was writing an article for a magazine on adapting native oriented stories into the television and film format, I ended up um, interviewing all the story editors and producers on all the television shows in Canada at that time that were being shot. I was talking with one and uh, she suggested I submit some story ideas just for the hell of it. I thought, what the hell? I did it. They bought it, I wrote it, they, they produced it, and it ended up being the season ender for that season of the show. So at the age of 25, I ended up writing an episode of one of the most successful and popular Canadian television shows in Canada uh, at that time. And still, there was a show called The Beachcombers. So out of nowhere, I'm now writing for television, having never taken a television writing course in my life. And so I wrote that and I was then about to start work on another show called uh, Street Legal. And here's where things, for all the theater students out there, things began to get really, really interesting. Around this time, what I refer to as the contemporary native literary renaissance happened. It happened in theater and it happened in all forms of, write, of writing 
uh, in the Native community. Um, and it began with the production of a play in Toronto. This little play called The Red Sisters by Thompson Highway. It was produced in 1986 in downtown Toronto. Now, what you have to know about this is Canadian theater was still getting on its feet after decades and decades of doing mostly American and um, British film uh, uh, theater. So Canadian theater was um, getting, getting into its stride. And suddenly out of nowhere, this playwright, this Cree playwright that nobody had ever heard of, produced this play called The Red Sisters that nobody had ever heard of. And it was produced in a non-traditional theater envir environment, the, the uh, Toronto Native Friendship Center. And the cast was a group of, of people nobody had ever heard of. And again, a third of that cast was non-Native. And it dealt with a, to a rather unconventional topic for a Canadian play that would change the face of contemporary Native theater. The, top, the plot of the Red Sisters was essentially seven Native women who want to travel to Toronto to participate in the world's largest bingo game. That's essentially the plot of the Red Sisters. And it was produced at the Native Canadian Centre. And during the first week or two, because it had no publicity, nobody knew about it, all these different things, nobody came to see it. And got, it was at the point where the playwright, Thompson Highway and the arts coordinator would be out on the street giving away free tickets for people to come and see the play. But because it was so innovative, so, so unconventional, so unique in its telling of a story and its portrayal of the indigenous community, by the end of the run, the play was selling out. And this is to show you how the, the speed of success, the speed of interest, um, the, 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 how quickly Canada took to the concept of indigenous theater. So the Red Sisters was produced in 86. 87, and in 86, it won two of the three major Canadian theater awards, the Governor General's, the Floyd S. Chalmers, and the Dora Maver Moore. The following year, it was remounted, did a national tour all across Canada, all the major uh, provincial capitals. The following year, 88, it represented Canada at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in Scotland. The following year, 89, the sequel was produced, Dry Lips Ought to Move to Capus Casing. And two years later, 91, a joint co-production of the Manitoba Theatre Centre, the National Arts Centre in Ottawa, and um, the Royal Alex in um, Toronto co-produced um, Drawn Up Sudden with the Capus Casing. And rumour has it, and I, I don't know this for sure, but basically the budget for all three productions was almost a million dollars, which was revolutionary for Canadian theatre at that time. Um, so suddenly, Native theatre was very, very popular, very, very exciting, and very, very interesting. There was an explosion of Native plays happening. And this is where I came into the picture. At the time, Thompson Highway was the artistic director of Native Earth Performing Arts, and he got this grant from the Ontario Arts Council for a writer in residence. And he had, um, basically, there were at that time, only two working Native playwrights in Ontario himself, and a man named Daniel David Moses, who is the outgoing playwright in residence. So he basically um, was sort of in, uh, in trouble. He had this grant that he wanted to spend, but he didn't know, couldn't find any money to spend it on. And as I'm sure you know, it goes against the nature of most theater artists to give back grants. So he was in a quandary. And he did what a lot of desperate people do. He went to the bottom of the barrel and there I was passed out. And he asked me if I wanted to be the playwright in residence for Native Earth Performing <laughs> Arts. And my first reaction was no. I uh, was not interested in theater. I thought theater artists were pretentious. Um, um, 
television was more fun and they fed you in television. Anybody who's ever worked on a television show know there's prop services, there is um, food, et cetera, et cetera, and theater. You're lucky if you get a box of donuts on the first day of rehearsal. So uh, my first reaction was no. Uh, you know, I was hopefully going to be working on a street legal. Uh, so I, I was getting intermittent work, not a lot of work. And Thompson knew this. And he also knew that I had this thing called the hungry landlord that kept breathing down my neck and wanting to be fed. So Thompson cheated. He said, look at it this way, Drew. It is, um, you have to sit through maybe two rehearsal periods, maybe write a play at the end of it. It's 20 weeks work and you get a, a check at the end of each of those 20 weeks. And I said, when do I start? So I am probably one of the few people you'll run into that got into theater for the money. So that's my glorious introduction to theater. So I started off at Native Earth as the writer in residence. And I figured if I wanna know, if I'm, if I'm in this, I better figure out what the hell I'm doing. I don't know much about theater because uh, I wasn't a theater artist, right? And, and at this time, going back to what I was saying earlier, the interesting thing about theater, indigenous theater was it became the medium of expression for many in the native community, primarily because theater is the next logical progression of oral storytelling. It's taking the audience on a journey using your mind, your body and your voice. And most indigenous people at that time had grown up in an oral environment, listening to stories being told. As I said, I grew up with, with three barely coherent television stations, etc. And I, I grew up right across from my grandparents and we'd have these huge bonfires with um, um, people sitting around for hours telling funny stories. So um, I grew up knowing how to tell stories orally. And theater is not that is is not that different. Um, and anybody who has taken theater um, uh, knows about playwriting out there. Frequently, the number one, I guess, problem of of inexperienced or first time playwrights is the fact that many of their characters in their for, in their first plays sound alike. That they all sound like variations of the playwright. Okay, and no two, four, ten people say the same thing the same way for the same reason. So frequently people in university learning to write plays um, have to learn to differentiate their characters by how they talk. Different people do things different way. Thompson, uh, who's also a trained and very talented musician, a pianist, when he's writing characters, they'll frequently give them a type of music. And so when he's writing their character, he, he, he writes their dialogue according to a type of music. And, uh, and for uh, Indigenous people, because we have that oral background too, that was easy for us because we knew how people told stories sitting around that bonfire, sitting around that kitchen table. So it became easier for us. And as we all know, writing a novel, writing short stories, writing creative nonfiction, you're sort of slaves to this concept of... Um, of, of, of the English language. You have to basically know how the English language works. You have to know your pronouns, your adverbs, your, your, your nouns, your objects, your, your clauses, prepositions, etc. So that write, sitting down and writing a novel when you've had, uh, in some cases, a certain amount of limited education, whether it's residential school, I went to what's called a day school on the reserve. I'm a graduate of the Mud Lake Indian Day School. And um, so prose can be very, very intimidating and, and still is. You've heard me say that I have um, 33 published books. Well, uh, yes, I do. But even to this day, I still do not know what a dangling participle or a split infinitive is. And I really don't care. I hire white people to know that for me. So anyway, so as I said, Native theater was exploding because Native people knew how to tell stories. And that is essentially what theater is, telling stories through dialogue. Um, so I'm involved in this. I'm, I'm sort of, um, I'm, I'm parachuted into the middle of this exploding genre of, of, of storytelling and theater. 
and I'm, I'm reading everything I can. I'm going to see as much as I can. It's an exciting time. I, I think of it as a golden age of indigenous uh, theater. And so as I'm, as I'm doing this, I began to pick up certain characteristics and I began to understand what was happening, why it was happening. During the first, I don't know, 15 years or more, even, even, even still to this day, the vast majority of contemporary native uh, theater is dark, depressing, bleak, sad, and angry. Almost all the characters created by indigenous authors at that time, and again, still to contemporary um, level, uh, the characters are all usually either oppressed, depressed, or suppressed for the most part. Um, in fact, it developed its own name. It's been called trauma porn. because, And that's basically because when an oppressed people get their voice back, they're going to write about being oppressed. And that's what was happening. Um, after, um, you know, two, three, four hundred years of colonization, of residential schools, of oppression, etc., and Native people are telling their stories, chances, basically, they're not going to have a lot of happy stories to talk about. They're going to write about the problems of being a colonized people. And that's what was pouring out of the First Nations community. I remember talking with um, Gallant writers from India, Maori writers from New Zealand, and Aborigine writers from Australia. And basically, when you have been at the bottom of the social hierarchy for hundreds or thousands of years, and you're given the opportunity to tell your story, chances are it's not going to be a comedy. So again, so again, all these stories are coming out of the First Nations community. And they're all dealing with the dysfunctional aspect of the First Nations community. In fact, there are basically three storylines that were being embraced. They were either victim narratives, historical narratives, or the byproducts of what I refer to as um, post-contact stress disorder. So that was basically Indigenous theater at that time. I remember going to see, talking with two, two Native women coming out of two different plays in two different cities, I asked them the same question and I got the same answer. I said, what did you think of the play? And they both said, I don't think I'm going to go see any more native plays. I'm tired of being depressed. So that was the state of native theater. It was originally designed, not designed, but it, it became, basically became, it was to ask uncomfortable questions. It was to make the audience squirm. It was to push the, the envelope as far as it would go. And um, so that was basically native theater for the first uh, five, uh, 15 years or so. Basically at, um, um, detailing residential school trauma um, and all the other types of traumas that had, happened, that had been forced upon indigenous people by the dominant culture. So I'm involved with this and I'm sort of sitting there going, you know, I'm not sure if this is, some, this is what I wanna get into. Um, there's a saying Thompson likes to use uh, to describe this kind of theater. He says, before the healing can take place, the poison must be exposed. And so that's what was happening. A lot of poison was being exposed during that time period. And I'm in the middle of this, and I'm not sure this was what I, I how I wanted to write. If I wanted to detail the, um, the, the, the negative experiences of, of, of my people. Um, I tended to have a more positive outlook of life. Um, I've been to over 150 First Nation communities across Canada and the United States. And everywhere I've been, I've been usually greeted with a laugh, a smile, and a joke. And I'd look at my mother who had raised me, and my mother was not oppressed, depressed, or suppressed. My mother was a very vivacious woman with a, with a funny sense of humor who, who enjoyed life. So again, I was having trouble rationalizing all this. And for me, I ended up having a conversation with an elder on the blood reserve in Alberta about this whole thing. And he said that in his opinion, for native people, humor is the WD-40 of healing. And when you think about it, 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 it sort of makes sense when compared with Thompson Highway's speech or, or line, before the healing can take place, 
the poison must be exposed. So basically what he's saying is those first years of indigenous theater were cathartic. They were dealing with the poison. They were exposing <laughs> the poison. And for me, I tended more towards the other quote. Humor is the WD-40 of healing, which I thought was such a cool saying. It was almost t-shirt worthy. And I was more interested in the healing than showing the poison. There were so many other much more talented writers than me that were superb at exposing the poison. And I wanted to more or less play doctor and, and work with the healing. So um, that was my introduction to the world of theater. So I sort of went off in a different direction. Everybody was doing all these plays about problems in the First Nations community. And um, whereas I went in the other direction and started to celebrate the indigenous sense of humor, because it's my opinion that indigenous humor has what has been what's allowed us to survive for all those hundreds of years of colonization. And uh, so I, I decided to write, incorporate humor in a lot of my work. My very first comedy uh, called the, the Bootlegger Blues was a play about a 58-year-old good Christian Ojibwe woman who through a series of circumstances finds herself in possession of 143 cases of beer that she has to bootleg in order to buy an organ for the church. And it's loosely based on a true story. So I started doing stories like that, um, just straight comedies, sheer celebrations of the indigenous sense of humor. Um, uh, one of my other comedies, uh, the Berlin Blues, was about a German business conglomerate that comes to a central Ontario First Nations community wanting to build the world's largest native theme park called Ojibwe World because it's Ojibwe-tastic. And uh, with such things as bumper canoes, and a 44 meter high dream catcher with interlacing laser beam webbing that keeps killing all the birds. And the big draw is a production of Dances with Wolves, the musical. So meanwhile, all this stuff was happening. And as I said, I'm going in and, and I'm doing my bit. And, and gradually, as the years went by, we, we crested, we plateaued with all the all the dark indigenous theater stuff. It's still happening out there, but Clarence began to sort of expand the boundaries of what could be considered really interesting theater. Um, about uh, five, seven years ago, there was a musical that was out called Children of God, sort of a musical about residential schools, um, about 15, no, but 20 years ago. Wow, that's a long time ago. I was um, approached to do a play. This is, this is one of the things where I talk about the fact that I've never taken a theater course in my life, and sometimes it shows. I was asked if I'd be interested in adapting and indigenizing a Bertolt Brecht Kurt Weill musical, The Rise and Fall of the City of Mahagoni. And I said, sure, I'd love to. Who are they? Thinking, you know, they're, 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 they're Canadians who did something a couple of years ago that I, they want me to indigenize. And I had to do my research to find out who they were. And we ended up doing that. So the, fa the, fa the face of contemporary Native theatre and literature is changing now. We're in an interesting period of time, um, specifically in the world of literature, right? Uh, what's really gotten interesting is the concept of genre fiction. It used to be, as I, as I say repeatedly, there used to be just very specific books and novels, poems, etc., coming out of the First Nations community, dealing with the dysfunctional aspect. But things have gone amazingly varied in the last uh, less than 10 years. Um, my very first novel that I was asked to write, I wanted to do something different. So I decided to write a native vampire novel. And I know what you're saying. Oh, God, not another native vampire novel. There's so many of them out there. But I did. There had never been one before. People said there's no such thing. And I said there is now. And I had fun doing it. Basically, I took a legend, a European legend, culturally appropriated it and indigenized it. And so I, I, did, I did a native vampire novel. My second novel was in a genre 
or a style that I'd never even heard of until I read the reviews. So my second novel, Motorcycles and Sweetgrass, was in this was a for, something called magic realism. Cool. About four or five years ago, I did a collection of my science fiction short stories. And here's where things get really interesting. Science fiction has exploded in the First Nation community. Um, about a couple of years ago, a man named Wabagijik Rice published a book called Moon of the Crusted Snow, which is an apocalyptic story about a, a flying community in Northern Ontario that suddenly loses all contact with the South. Electricity goes down, everything goes down, and they have to survive the winter using a combination of their, their, their traditional methods as still supplied by the elders and using you know their, their, uh, what contemporary um, mechanisms they have that still work, like snowmobiles, et cetera, rationing the gas. So it's an interesting exploration of the two worlds of being forced to survive. And again, another couple of years ago, a woman named Sherry Demerlane, a Métis woman, wrote a book, a uh, dystopian um, science fiction future book called The Marrow Thieves, which was um, a YA novel that became very, very successful. Basically, um, the dominant culture settlers had lost the ability to dream and it was affecting them negatively but they discovered that native people still had the ability to dream. So they were harvesting marrow from native people. It sounds kind of weird, but it works. It's really interesting showing how these indigenous people are being forced to survive hunt, a hide. And basically it's an allegory for residential schools when they came to take kids away to residential school. Here they're coming to harvest their, their marrow. And um, uh, there was a book out, I don't, I don't have it handy, but. Um, in Canada, a, a collection of um, gay and lesbian and trans science fiction short stories that was published just as I said five or six years ago, sort of again pushing that envelope, taking the issues of today and exploring them um, through science fiction. In the States, there's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful writer named uh, Rebecca Roanhorse, who's Pueblo, who wrote one of the most successful fantasy science fiction books in the States five years ago called Reign of Lightning about um, the future. Uh, it's, always a, it's, it's always a dystopian apocalyptic future um, where the Navajo reservation has built a wall around itself and have tried to survive the best way they can. But something about this environmental apocalypse has reawakened all the Navajo spirits and gods. So that's get mixed up in all of this. And it, it was highly successful, so successful, in fact, that um, Star Wars, the company of Star Wars, ended up um, hiring her to write uh, a Star Wars novel. And she wrote a Star Wars novel and it was wonderfully, wonderfully received. That's how successful she became, right? So um, there, there's that. Um, there, two years ago, there was a movie released called Blood Quorum by Jeff Barnaby, and it is a native zombie movie, um, exploring the concept of what if there's the zombie virus was out and it was affecting everybody except native people. And it set up this sort of interesting thing about, you know, uh, people like me who are half and, and, and blood quorum and wh uh, who gets it, who doesn't, and, and, and the fact that um, white people are trying to get into the reserves for safety as opposed to live out there. So it ends up, it ends up presenting a whole different reinterpretation of the zombie story. Um, so again, genre fiction was getting very, very, uh, was and is getting very, very successful. Um, there was a, a friend of mine, Daniel Heath Justice, wrote a trilogy of um, uh, that basically is an indigenous Lord of the Rings. It's got elves. It's got um, it's got dwarves. It's got swords. It's got sorcery. All of that stuff, and um, it, it it did very very well. Uh, another friend of mine ended up doing a book. She collected, edited, and and published a collection of international indigenous erotica. I like to think of it as Fifty Shades of Red. So and Thompson Tom King Tom King. When he's not writing award-winning fiction and nonfiction, his hobby is writing murder mysteries. 
So you may be familiar with some of his murder mysteries. My last novel that I'm currently out shopping right now is an indigenous horror novel, just because it's so much fun to play around with all these different genres that are out there, right? Anybody who saw the Trickster series last year on CBC, not going into all the trouble of surrounding that. So that's sort of a mixture of the mystical, the magic, and contemporary life. But what again, what I find so interesting about sort of the uh, looking at the, the the darker negative aspect of Indigenous life, you know, the 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 uh, the characters in it are are living in poverty, dealing with drugs and alcohol abuse. It's still that sort of mentality of of of, of victimhood and colonization, exposing the poison. Anyways. Um, I have sort of reached the end of where I can go with this particular topic without going off into uh, a long, elongated um, tendrils off in different directions. Uh, is there something you'd like me to focus on specifically, Brian? Uh, no, I, th I think we're going to open it up to Q&A. And I, I should have mentioned right at the top of it that um, if you have a question, I see we have one question in the Q&A right now. Please enter your questions into the Q&A. And just before we start that, I'll, we'll, you know, I'll read the questions out. But uh, I just want to, uh, I just want to affirm the, uh, the the wonderful generosity and wit of Drew's mother because I had the pleasure. Drew had invited me to. We were working on one of his plays in Peterborough, and he invited me over to his house. And I, I said to him the other day when he came, I said, "I, I remember your mother and that that warm, warm evening." So she was a wonderful woman. So Q and A. Uh, we have a question from Ryan. He says, growing up and discovering your love of stories, was there a, a story or stories that you especially loved or particularly stuck with you and inspired you to write? Not so much to write. I mean, I just, I read anything and everything. And uh, so I didn't have one particular story that inspired me to write. I've, I've come across a lot of things that inspired me almost to give up writing, thinking that I'll never come that close to even, even, um, um, approaching some of the stuff I've read, uh, the brilliance involved. But one of the things I discover when my teenage years, right? Um, I basically there are three types of people out there that, uh, depending on what they like to read, one is they're either Catcher in the Rye people, or they're To Kill a Mockingbird people, or they're the um, the Outsiders people. And I was always an Outsiders people. Uh, I loved the Outsiders. I read it once a year. And the thing is, I. I appreciated it. I reacted to it. I am um, related to it. Uh, um, because if you know the story, it's about a group of uh, low income um, uh, kids, teenagers, who are on sort of the wrong side of the tracks, wrong side of the law, um, growing up and having to deal with the well to do, um, much more successful youth. And I mean, I'm a kid who grew up on a reserve and we were bust in nearby, a nearby a white town to go to school. So even though this book was about uh, was about youth in, I think it's Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, it really, it had an impact on me as just a kid, a, a native kid from Curb Lake. Great. Our next question comes from Kyra and she says, thank you for sharing about your rich and varied experiences as a professional writer. A question for us students, how do you find or make the time to write without getting distracted? Do you create a writing schedule for yourself or do you tend to work more on inspiration? No, 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 no. Um, writing is a job. Um, inspiration is important, but it's uh, A-I-S, ass in seats. Um, so how can I put this? I'm gonna let you in on a secret. I actually hate writing. If I could do anything else, I would, but I have no serviceable talent, so I became a writer. Now, that is to say, I also like using a quote by a woman named Dorothy Parker, who once said, I hate writing, but I love having written. And that is so true. So getting back to answering your question, um, because I hate writing, I don't like doing outlines. Uh, that's just more writing. But for me, stories need to be planned. They need to be structured. They need to be they need to be shaped. And I do that in my mind when I'm driving, when I'm in the shower, when I'm um, uh, making coffee. Basically, when I have a couple minutes to myself, I will sit, think about a project to the point where um, I will figure it out. I will, I will like 
I'll know. And then after I've thought about it, depending on the size of the project, whether it's a play, novel or whatever, I won't start it until I've, I know my opening line, my closing line, my act breaks, I know my characters, etc. Then I will sit down and I will just jump into it and write it. That way, uh, uh, and, I'll, and I'll just go through it. So I do write every day when I have something to write. I usually put in uh, two and a half hours in the morning and three and a half hours in the afternoon after lunch and a nap. Um, and uh, I try, as I said, I, I try and develop it in my mind as best I can. But the thing is, if you develop your characters as well as you should, they should be as three dimensional as your best friends. Sometimes they'll take you on a journey. And I have to say, as a writer, when I'm writing a novel or a play, the final product ends up being about 60% of what I anticipated and 40% what I discover along the way, thanks to the characters in the situation. So um, yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of thinking, it's a lot of planning and it's sitting down and doing a lot of writing and for, for, I can do as I've thought it, once I've thought it out, writing a full length play, you know, a two act play, I usually try and write between eight and 11 pages a day. As I said, most of it's thought out in my mind, and I'm just putting it on paper, and then I find the stuff that the characters are telling me. So I do, I can do a full length play in about two weeks. Fantastic. Uh, I don't have any questions in the Q and A right at the moment. Please, you know, enter them, and I'll I'll uh, get them to Drew. Uh, but I I have a question while we have a moment right here because uh, I'm interested in your characterization of um, early. Uh, you know, indigenous uh, drama being kind of dark, basically, right? And and I'm thinking back to Thompson and uh, and the Res Sisters and uh, Dry Lips Auto moved to Cabas Casing, which I know more because I was one of the original producers on that one. But the Res Sisters, pretty hilarious, actually, right? I certainly would see your point on Dry Lips, right? Because it's a it's at its core, it's a really dark story, but with lots of hilarity in it at the same time. So. But, but you're talking about more about the subject matter rather than the tone of the drama. Is that what you're... And also, I think uh, uh, Red Sister and Dry Lips are sort of the exception that proves the rule. Uh, yes, everything I've said in some ways doesn't really apply because, yes, they're, they're, they're funny. They're, they're interesting people. Um, some would argue that Red Sisters is the better play and Dry Lips has the better scenes, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, but it's one of the only... The few instances I can think of off the top of my head where, yeah, it, the, the, the characters in it are, fu are funny, have a sense of humor, uh, are, are wonderfully defined and uh, have a certain whimsy about them and, and as they're trying to raise money to go to uh, the, the world's biggest bingo game. So for me, that's the exception to the rule. Okay, great. Very good. We have another uh, question here. Let me just see. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, one from Douglas Laird. Do you have any thoughts about how First Nations people adopted to using English? Is there a tendency to change the rules for the language is spoken, but written language as well? Those language patterns that were not in their cultural paradigm? Oh, goodness. I have no idea. It sounds like you need a, you want a cultural anthropologist. I'm just, I just make things up for a living. Um, I mean, there's a couple things to keep in mind. For one thing, the, um, a time of contact uh, in Canada, there were over 50 to 60 separate languages and dialects spoken. And most of those languages were um, gender neutral. In most languages, there's no masculine or feminine unless something is specifically male or female. So as a, as a result, that comes into our storytelling. A good example of that, as uh, Red Sisters and Dried Ups will tell you, is the trickster is frequently um, uh, described as being male, right? He's always given a masculine gender. Uh, and that's primarily because in the English language, as with most Romance languages uh, or, or languages, anything that, that is, um, that, that has, uh, what's the what term I'm looking for? A presence or is, is aggressive or, or, or changes things is often given a masculine pronoun. And but in reality, the trickster can be male or female. It's not it's not relevant. And in Res Sisters, the masculine is male. In Dry Lips, 
uh, she's female. So that's sort of an example of how, change, how, how the use of, of an indigenous language can affect the making of the, the, the play. One of the things I often like to use as an example that used to be an example, I'm, I'm not so sure anymore, is the concept of um, the, 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 the central character issue uh, that um, uh, I mentioned in your class. The fact that, you know, Western European drama, you have a central character that's given a goal or an objective and spins the novel or the play or the movie, overcoming a series of obstacles to either achieve or be denied their um, objective. And that is essentially the vast majority of Western drama. And um, the thing with, with, with a lot of early native theater is it wasn't that, it was uh, more ensemble pieces. Each character was as important as the next character. Red Scissors and Dry Lips, there's eight characters all together, uh, and they all have the same number of lines, the same number of importance, um, and, and uh, are on stage for the same amount of time, and all have repercussions in each other's life. So, and, and when with my work, like I remember I was a writer in residence in University of Michigan, and I did a play, and somebody commented that there was no um, central character in um, my play, that she said she was wondering who to root for, who was the central character. I said, all of them. Personally, I find it much more interesting to write for four central characters than just one central character and some supporting people. Um, and I'm about to start, in the next two days, I'm about to start on a movie script. I'm adapting the Berlin Blues into a feature film. And I've been talking with the producers and they're reading it and they said, we don't know who the central character is. Is it, is it Angie? Is it, is, is it uh, Donalda and Trailer, et cetera? And I'm going, they're all the central characters. I find that so much more interesting. Now that's the way I think, because, because in the native community, no one person is more important than everybody else. The community is more important than the individual. And I think that's how it came across in our writing. There's no, you know, who's the central character in Hamlet or King Lear, right? Uh, or in Death of a Salesman. Um, kind of rather obvious. But, in, you know, the, the contemporary native literary renaissance happened in 86. That was a lot of decades ago. And I think a lot of the playwrights today who have been trained now in the, um, the university system are taught the European method much more commonly than in the indigenous method. So I think a lot more contemporary plays do have the central character more than, than it did traditionally. Now, well, we could spend uh, hours speaking about that. It's a fascinating subject. But here's a question from Lisa, uh, who says that it's certainly a special occasion to meet you virtually or otherwise. Thank you for your time and expertise. Uh, might be a bit of a strange question. I hope I didn't miss anything while I was busy taking notes. But anyways, how do you feel about fame and how does it feel to be famous? Do you strive for fame? Was it something that you ever thought you'd be famous? Uh, well, I, I doubt I'm famous. I'm a, I'm, I'm a basically, I'm, what's the term? I'm a medium-sized fish in a, in a, in a small pond. Um, I don't know. It's, it's kind of fun. It's a, a, it is fun, but you don't, obviously you don't, you don't go into native theater for the fame. Let me put it that way. Um, it's just an interesting byproduct of what you're doing. Uh, I'm a storyteller and sometimes storytellers get a certain amount of fame. Sometimes they don't. Uh, I do what I do. I will say this. It's not so much about the fame part. That's part of it. But the larger picture is it's fun. I talk about hating writing and, and it's, it's, it's a tough master uh, writing. It, 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 can, it can humble you very, very quickly, but the final products, the books, the plays, stuff like that, it's a fun industry to, industry to be in. I've been to 19 countries around the world. I've, I've lectured in places I literally never thought I would be. I gave a lecture on indigenous humor at a, at a, at a multicultural conference in India, of all places. I was an Indian in India. Um, so fame is a small part of it, but I just love the, 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 the fact that it's a really fun industry to be in because my big fear is ending up working in a, a cubicle somewhere. 
Well, it's uh, we're both theater people, so I feel the hook, you know, the big hook coming in to, to pull us off the stage here pretty quick. But we do have time for one more question, and we're going to uh, return to Ryan, who said, asks, uh, having had so much experience in a wide variety of writing forms, from articles to television to novels to plays, is there a medium that is your favorite for any reason? It's hard to say. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't work in any of the other ones if I didn't enjoy it, if it wasn't fun, right? Um, but I have to say my first love is theater. Theater is what's made, what made me. Theater is what I'm more comfortable in. I can sit down, start working on a play and feel at home. Whereas writing a novel is like a six month to a year commitment. And then you're, you're waiting to find out if somebody's going to like it and publish it. And theater, I can guarantee, I can usually tell myself I can find somebody who 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 want to produce it. So above all else, I think of myself as a playwright. Um, I'm, I, I'm married to theater, but I have many mistresses. Right. Well, uh, I think we're probably close to uh, at the end of our time right here. So it's been a great, great pleasure to see you again, Drew. And uh, wow, you have so many thoughts on, uh, on the, this wonderful art form that we all practice, right? So Thank you for taking the time to do it. Uh, I guess you have office hours. Do you, do you have a session where people Yeah, I, I can find the clock. I, much like everything else, I have to try and find that Zoom window somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. What time? Do you know what time it is? Two o'clock. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in a half an hour. Yeah, in a half an hour. So please, you know, I'm sure there's more questions. Uh, this is all of your opportunity to uh, get the chance to meet uh, meet and talk to this um, wonderful theater artist. So thanks a lot again, Drew. That's been, it's been fabulous. It has been. Thank you very much. Thank you.